bless him on tonight. We magnify him on tonight. So the song just says, come on and bless the Lord with me. Hallelujah. So we lift up a praise on tonight. Hallelujah. Because he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. You're all I need. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe Every for me. Oh, oh, oh. 
Hey, good evening, everyone. Glad to welcome the online guests and everybody in the building to the Tuesday night Bible study with Pastor Williams. I'll be reading Psalm 16, verses 5 through 10. I'll be reading from the King James Study Bible. It reads it thus: The Lord is a portion of my inheritance, and of my cup that maintaineth my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a godly, a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoice. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And Lord bless the rears, he let us pray. Most great heaven, Father, we want to thank you. Father, we want to thank you for this glorious opportunity you've given us this evening. Father, we ask you to be with us, Father. Be with us as we continue to do, do the study, to continue to move forward in our studies. Father, we ask you to be with the pastor as he brings us what you've given him to bring us. Now, I want to be with him, but be with us, the people, as we receive it, as we take it in, as we dissect it, and we take it out to the community and pass it on. Father, we ask you to continue to bless Mount Zion as we move forward, as we continue to do your work and your will. Father, we ask you to bless us, bless each and every household, each and every person. Bless the families, Father. Bless those in the hospital. Watch over them. Father, bless anybody that's breathing. Especially, Father, we ask you to watch over our children. Definitely our children, because they will know they go through things that we didn't go through way back when we were. Father, watch them and continue to help them grow. Continue to keep someone in their past and try to help them along. And hopefully that one day they'll be going straight now. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And come on, let the church say amen. Come on, y'all can say amen a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit stronger. Amen. A amen. We are excited. We're excited tonight to be here with you once again on our Tuesday night Bible study. We thank you for tuning in with us. Thank you for those that are here with us in person. Uh, we are going through a study called Christology, the study of Christ. If you're going to serve God, it is only natural that we know who he is, what he has done, what he has accomplished, but more importantly, if we know who he is, we can know who we are. And it will help us to be able uh, to, to grow and to develop into who he wants us to be. And it's a process. It's a long-term process. Matter of fact, it's a lifetime process, but we have already begun the journey, and I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for it. A amen. Amen. Let us go before the throne of grace. Father, uh, we come once again in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we do ask that you would be with us on tonight, uh, that as your word go forth, the teaching, this is good foundational teaching on who you are. And we pray that you would bless us, bless those that are watching and listening. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen. It, it, we, are, we finished up uh, on last week. Uh, we, were, we were going over um, two things before we, we stopped. Uh, we went over, number one, uh, we went over th that uh, who the shepherd is. We went over his deity. Uh, we went over his deity. We gave you some divine names. And then we end up, ended up giving you, I think, about 39 things uh, that Christ has done for us. And one, we ended with divine worship, divine worship. And uh, we thank God, for, thank God for divine worship and thank God because he is so good to us. Amen. A amen. Um, we also went over on with the Jesus Christ on a few, a few things uh, pertaining, to, um, on, pertaining to Adam Adam and Eve. Uh, so I want you to open your, your, your studies tonight. I believe you stopped on page. Uh, I need, can you go make sure I get a couple more pages? I need a, 
a couple of more handouts. If you would get that for me, uh, a couple of more handouts for me, uh, I would really appreciate it. Uh, we stopped on page, um, we, we, we stopped rather on page 15, I believe on, on last week, and 16 is where we are going to start, start on, on tonight. I believe it's page 16 in your book. Amen. What page do you have there? It has no number on it. What's at the top of your page? The page, first question is 22. Okay. Well, uh, can I go get, can you go get the, the whole handout? I had a handout that I need. This is not the right pages here for me. Amen. Okay, I have, uh, do you see on page, uh, uh, page, on page 15, what do you have at the top of your page? You don't have a number. Okay, no number. 42. Okay, well, we, we already completed that. Um, okay, okay, okay. If I could get the book, go get my, if, yeah, just go get the original book, and then I'll know exactly where I am. Amen. The Lord is good. Come on, y'all. Say amen all the time. No matter what, the Lord is still good. Amen. He's good to me. I don't know about you, but that's my testimony. The Lord has been good. He is good to me. Even, even, even right, right now. Right now, uh, the Lord is, is still good, and he is still worthy to be praised. Amen. Everybody here today have something to be thankful for, don't you? Amen. When you woke up this morning... Um, you was clothed in your right mind. Y'all know when we were younger, we took that for granted. Yes, we Amen. We thought we were just going to be live and be young, young and strong and vibrant all the time. But you know, the older you've gotten, the older we've gotten. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. My, my, my clock didn't stop. It's, it's still running continually as well. Uh, but the older, older we've gotten, the more we can see the grace and the love of God in our lives, and uh, you know we shouldn't take it take it for, for granted. That's what Paul would tell the uh, uh, tell Timothy. He said, you know, when you have youthful lust, he said, flee from it. Don't 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 get don't get caught up. Okay, we good? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just need my original book to to, to do this. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. All right. I I, I think we I think we 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 on point here. Here now, I know where we stopped last week, and we will be able to uh, to start on. I have number four, where it says prophecy. We stopped where the prophecies of his death. Y'all had that, okay. And now on number four, uh, it is uh, where we went over. He he was betrayed by a friend. He was falsely accused. Everybody got that? He was spit up on. He was pierced, ridiculed, forsaken of God. Bones not broken. H, he was silent. I, he, he, he died with the wicked. J, he was buried in the rich man's tomb. And K, he to be sacrificed for sin. And then the next one is four, which is prophecy of his resurrection. It's prophecy of his resurrection. And uh, that's what Deacon Johnson read for you tonight out of Psalm 16. I had him to read verses 5 through 11, the prophecies of his resurrection. Uh, the next letter is by the messianic line. Prophecy of his resurrection. The next line is uh, by, his, by the messianic line. Uh, now this is important uh, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to explain something to you as, as we, go, we go forward. First, number one is Adam and Eve. Okay, now you got to get the picture with me, and we're going to be rolling. And when Adam and Eve were the first humans' parents, on the, they were the first humans on the earth. So when they fell, when they stumbled, uh, Jesus had, God had to protect his messianic line for his son to come. And as you study through the Old Testament, Everyone in the Old Testament, sometimes you could see the whole world corrupt and it would be only one man. Let me give you an example. The whole world was destroyed and yet God saved one man 
Noah, and his family. Y'all know why God saved him? Because God had to protect the messianic line. God had to keep the bloodline open for his son to come. Okay? Okay, number letter A. Their fall necessitates his coming. Their fall, Adam and Eve fall, necessitated his coming. It made it necessary for him to come. B, by their sin, human nature is corrupted. What was their sin? What, what, was, what was their sin? It was disobedience. Now listen to how the disobedience started. I, I, I want to I set the scene for you because we, we, we talked about him coming in the Messianic line. Adam and Eve was in the garden in a perfect environment. There was nothing wrong with being where they were. In Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, God called Adam and told Adam this. He says, the day you eat off of the tree of the good and knowledge, the knowledge and evil, he said, you're going to surely die. This is what God told him, and this is what he's saying. And y'all look up here at me, some of you are watching us on television. In other words, this is what God told Adam. He said, Adam, uh, you in this church, we are in this sanctuary ton tonight, and this is what God told Adam. You can sit in every pew in the whole church except for this one. He said, everything I made for you, you can enjoy. But I'm going to give you a restriction. Now, this, listen, Adam and, Adam and Eve was made with a free will. And in all, because they had a free will, God gave them a choice. See, every one of us have a free will. And if, by having a free will, you have a choice whether you will obey God or disobey God. So what God did is he put Adam and Eve in the garden and say, you can sit in any sanct a seat in this sanctuary with the exception of this one. This was the restriction. And the restriction was, and this is what Adam and Eve did, like so many people do. Instead of them enjoying all of the rest of the church, the only thing they did is got focused on why they couldn't sit here. And that's what people do today. People, even, even Christians, God have given you so much in your life and so many people only focus on the one or two things wrong rather than enjoying the rest of your life. And that's, the, that's why God put the restriction on them. So it says, they were corrupted. Therefore, and I'm going to be, therefore, Christ's birth must be a supernatural character in order that he might be sinless. So when he was born, was he born of a man? He didn't have no man's blood in him because in man's blood is the corruption. Let us, let us see. They received the first promise of his coming. And this is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Bible. That's in Genesis 3.15. I want you to put it up. This is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ coming after Adam and Eve fell. And I want to say this about Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, first of all, keep that up for me. Adam disobeyed and Eve was deceived. Everybody got it? Let me, let me, let me explain it to you. In Genesis 2.15-17, when God gave Adam the commandment, Eve wasn't even made yet. Adam's job was to teach her what God told him. And we know he told her what God says because when she started talking with Satan in Genesis 3, everything Adam told her, she told Satan. And I want you to see this, and this is important for us. The first thing... Satan did, and he does this to us. When, Adam, when Eve was conversing with, with Satan, this is what he says. Have God indeed said. The first thing Adam did is he questioned the authority of God's word. And whenever people want to say, I know what the Bible says, but they are questioning the validity of of God's word. That's what caused them to sin. And so what, Adam, Eve, what Satan did is he made Eve think it was all right. But Adam knew better. And because he knew better, God held him accountable. And you can see it in Genesis 3, maybe verse 8, 9. It says that when God came back in the cool of the day, he called for Adam. And you know why he called for Adam? 
because the one who had the command was the one who is accountable. If you know what God says, it's what you are accountable for. You're not accountable for what other people know. You're accountable for what you know individually. Uh, let's go down to number two, Abel. Okay, I'm sorry, let me read Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise his head, and you shall bruise his head. That's a picture of Satan. That's a picture of when Satan thought that he had Jesus Christ dead. He said, look, I got him now. I got him. And, but he, he missed one thing. They, he forgot on Resurrection Sunday morning. When Jesus got up, that negated everything that Satan had did. Okay, now let's go to number two, Abel, A-B-E-L. His first death, in his, in his death, Satan attempts to break the line in Abel, in Abel. Y'all know you had Cain in Abel, right? Okay, uh, Seth, number three, S-E-T-H. Seth, that's in Genesis 4.25. His descendants, including Enoch and Methuselah. In other words, I want y'all to see how the Messianic line has to be protected. When you read through the Old Testament, remember, the reason uh, it's a picture of Jesus Christ coming, because from Genesis to, the, to Malachi, it's only teaching that Jesus is on his way. And you remember in Matthew, 20, Matthew 1, it says Jesus is here. In, in other words, the Old Testament says he's coming. He's coming. The New Testament opened up with, he's here. In Matthew 1, 25, Emmanuel being interpreted, God with us. The God of the universe showed up. Number four is Noah. Preserved through, through the flood by God. Everyone else was destroyed, but God kept one man to keep his messianic line open. Number five is Abraham. Most important because he was the father of the nation through which the Messiah would come, recipient of many promises. And y'all, you can you know in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12, put up Genesis chapter 12 for me, beginning in verse 1. God gave him a, a, a blessing. Let me show you how God operates theologically. Y'all can jot this down in your margin. There are dispensations in the Bible. A dispensation is another word for an economy. So in the scripture, God gives seven dispensations. The first dispensation was when Adam and Eve was in the garden and they were naked and they were not ashamed. They were innocent. The second dispensation is when their eyes were open, they moved from the dispensation of innocence to conscience. Because when they knew they had sinned, Sin always make you hide. You don't ever have to worry about if a person is sinning because sin going to make a person hide. That's what Adam and Eve did. They took fig leaves and they hid themselves because that's what sin going to do to you. And then they moved, when God moved from, uh, uh, from, from conscience, he moved to Noah, which is human government. After the flood, God established a human government on the earth. Now we in Abraham, so God says, y'all know Noah fell, right? Y'all know how Noah fell? Noah fell because, well, he got drunk. And when he got drunk, one of his sons saw his father's nakedness and turned around and backed up. He wanted to honor his father. But one son, I think it was Ham, who Put, looked up on his father's nakedness, looked up on his father's shame, and God had to discipline him for that. And then since human government didn't work, God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find me one man. Y'all know who that man is? He's Abraham. Of all of the people in the world, God chose Abraham because he was a man of faith. And then when Abraham, y'all know Abraham, fell as well. Let me back up. In every dispensation, God gave man two things. And I believe God does the same things for us. First of all, God give, he gave man every, he gave him an assignment of what he wanted. And he also gave him provision to fulfill what he called him to do. 
You are a child of God. God have called you to do something and everything God have called you to do. He's made provisions already for you to accomplish it. And every time the only way they fail is it wasn't because other people made them fall. They did it themselves. Number six is Isaac. Abraham, Isaac. And number seven is Jacob. Number eight is Judah. Judah means praise. I have a reference here in Genesis 49. When uh, Jacob was old, he started passing on the blessing to all of his sons. He, he, he passed on the blessings. And then we have number nine, Boaz and Ruth. B-O-A-Z and Ruth. Y'all remember their descendants was Obed. Um, we went through Ruth here, I think last year. You remember Ruth and Boaz had a son called Obed. And then Obed had a son named Jesse. And then Jesse had a son named King David. Y'all see how the line, is, the messianic line is, is, is moving forward. Now, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, and David is number 10. David is number 10, along with Abraham in importance. And uh, he is the beginning of the royal line. This privilege was taken away from Saul because of his sin. David is the recipient of great promises concerning the future glory of the kingdom and the king. David's son, uh, David's son in 2 Samuel, God gave, made a covenant with him and said, someone from your loins are going to sit on my throne forever. Y'all do know when we get to heaven, y'all know the, th the throne they, God is Jesus going to be stand, sitting on is David's. David's kingdom, David's kingdom, David is going to be restored. Number 11, from this point, there are two Two, two T-W-O, lines of descendant to be observed. Letter A, through David's son, Solomon. Through David's son, Solomon. Number one, this is the legal line. When you are a descendant, you have a legal right to your father's inheritance. This is the legal line. Number two, but because of the sin of Solomon's descendant, Jehoshaphat, also called Jeconiah and Corniah, God said through Jeremiah that none, no man of his seed should prosper ruling in Judah. I want, can you put up Jeremiah 22, verses, beginning in verse number 24? I want you to see this. Uh, this is important. Now, uh, and I forgot to tell y'all that uh, I'm so grateful y'all hanging in there with me because... The study of Christology is not really just, uh, is not an elementary class for students. This is, this is a little deeper on who Christ is. This isn't just your Sunday school lesson. This goes deep into theology, and y'all have been hanging in there with me, and I've tried to make it palatable, but this is something that is foundation as a Christian. Now, what I'm about to explain to you in Jeremiah chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse number four, I'm going to show you how the line from, from, from King Solomon to his descendant, Jeconiah, was cut off. Okay? Now, you remember God had been protecting the whole line. And God, Solomon's descendant sinned so much that God said, I got to cut the line off. I'm going to show you something. Listen, and if, in, if you indeed do this thing, then, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sat on the throne of David. Uh, I'm sorry, I need verse 22. Verse 22? 24. 24, I'm sorry, verse 24. Jeremiah 22, 24. I want you to see. As I live, says the Lord, through Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. God is saying, you got the signet, you got the royal line. He said, but because of your sin, I'm going to pluck you off. I'm going to cut you off. Listen to the next verse. And I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life, 
and into the hand of those who face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldean. God is saying, y'all been sinning so, so much down in Judah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let the Babylonians come in here and take you over. Go to the next verse. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you in another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. This is talking about the 70-year captivity. Verse 28. But to the to the land to which they desire to return, they shall not return. Y'all do know that many of the people who went down into captivity never returned. Let me give you one of them that, didn't, that, was, that was old and never returned. Daniel didn't come back. Y'all remember Daniel was a young man when he went into captivity? But he didn't come back. There were some people didn't come back. Put the next verse up for me. I believe it's uh, a verse number 20, 29, 28. And is this man Kenai a despised, broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? Listen to verse 29 and 30 uh, in, 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 in this. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. You see how the descendant had got so corrupt? God said, I'm just going to cut them off. Now, let me go back down to number three. I'm going to show you something. This is good theology. Number three on your handout. Y'all got it? Is Joseph. Joseph, the husband of Mary, was a direct descendant of Je Jehoiachin. Thus, the first in his house would be heir apparent to the throne of David. You see that? He was an offspring of, of, Jeho of Jehoiachin. And what God did is God let him be Jesus' legal right father, but not his birthright father. Oh, y'all see, y'all understand what I'm saying? Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father, but he was his legal father because he was the descendant of Jehoiakim. This is some good, I'm telling you, this is some good, you get these things in your spirit, you can grow spiritually. Number four, thus Jesus was the heir, H-E-I-R, a parent, and still is. You see how the line was cut off? But God made a way. How did, okay, and we're going to go over this a little bit later. How did Jesus, how did God allow Joseph to be the legal father and keep his own rules and laws to let Joseph be his legal father? He didn't let Joseph's seed be in Mary. He circumvented the, cur the, 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 cut, the, the curse and the cutoff of Jehoiakim by allowing Mary to be born of the Holy Spirit. That's why the line is, the, the, the curse was there, but the line is still available because God worked it out. That's what he has done for each one of us. Number five, but since, there's no blank there, but I'm going to read it. But since Jesus was not actually the son of Joseph, but merely his foster son, the curse of Jeremiah 20, 30 does not fall on him. So Jesus wasn't like every other man born with a curse. He was born perfect and sinless. Number six, Matthew records this official genealogy. You can see it in Matthew. You, I used to hear the older preachers, they, we don't say it much now, but they would say the 40 and two generations, there's 14 generations, there's 14 generations, then there's another 14 generations. This is what Matthew is declaring, that Jesus Christ is the king. So when you look in Matthew's gospel, why do you have a genealogy of all of the people in Jesus' bloodline? Because Matthew is presenting Jesus as the king of the Jews. And if you're going to be a king, you got to have a bloodline. Y'all see it? It's important we understand it. Uh, letter, letter B, through David's son, Nathan. Number one, this is the line of actual physical descent. Physical descent. Number two is Heli, H-E-L-I, Heli. And Luke 3.22 was the father of Mary. Joseph was of Heli in the sense that he was his son-in-law. 
So you see how God worked his divine plan out to keep the messianic line open so his son Jesus could come. Number three, thus Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, his genealogy is of Mary and thus the actual genealogy of Jesus after the flesh. Y'all see it. So Mary is the genealogy of the flesh. Luke is his father by legal right, which Jesus, God sent his son Jesus to, 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 to blend the, the, cut, the curse that was on Jeconiah. Y'all see how he came. Now let's go down to number two. And if you don't get it, write it down. Just think about it, because this is, this is complex. But I'm going to tell you, if you get it, you will understand it, that Jesus just didn't show up and pick a man and a woman to be his father. And what I'm saying is he had to keep his word in order for Jesus to be God. He had to still keep his word that he had prophesied in the Old Testament to give someone on the legal line to be one of his descendants. So I'm just trying to paint you a picture of how he kept his word. Jesus will keep his word to you and to me. Number two, Christ's humanity. Christ's humanity. And you, and just a little bit more, I want you to write it down. Christ's humanity shown by, shown by, the Annunciation. Somebody said, go on, spell it, Pastor. Go on, say it. Spell it, Pastor. Spell Annunciation. A-N-N-U-N-C-I-A-T-I-O-N. Let me say it again. A-N-N-U-N-C-I-A-T-I-O-N. And the last word in there, and birth. His Annunciation and birth. Christ is humanity. Now let, go to the next blank. Uh, where it says, and you can see it in Micah 5, 2. I'm not going to read it. Micah tells tell you where Jesus is going to be born. Uh, in uh, in Ephraim, Bethlehem, he picks the, the, the village where he's going to be born. All of this is part of his line. Uh, num the next word, uh, the word incarnation. The word incarnation. Y'all see that? Means the assumption of human form or nature. That is in the American College, that's a definition of the American College Dictionary. In John 1.14, which I'm going to read for you, without ceasing to be God, the Word became man and lived as such among men. John 1.14, this is, this is what I'm, I want you to see, how the God of the universe became a man. And this is what John 1.14 tells us how he did it. OK, it tells us how to how to a God that is a spirit in John 4, 24, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. And then you all know what that means. It means that since God is a spirit and he says those that worship him in spirit and in truth means that when you because your spirit inside of you, when you hear the truth, you will worship in your spirit. Many people want God to operate on something, but it has to be based upon the truth. Okay, look in John 1, 14, and the word. Y'all remember the word is the logos. A logos is a self-expression. Y'all know how we find out how people are or what they think? Can I give y'all a little secret? Listen to what they say. If you want to find out about a person, listen to them. What they say is an expression of who they are. For the issues of life flow from the heart. Whatever is in a person's heart is going to be revealed through their mouth. And you may have to listen to them a little while, but I guarantee you, most of you here that are here and watching, you can listen to people and you can listen to them for 30 seconds and get a pretty good clue of what they're all about. Amen. Listen to what John says. And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and what? And truth. Okay, go back down to uh, the next word is, the next blank is incarnation. Incarnation. It does not mean that the divine nature changed into a human nature, or became anything else but divine. Rather, it means that the divine nature took the human into union with itself. 
And thus there resulted a new and mysterious, mysterious being, the God-man. Now in theology, I'll write this word down, it, it, it is called the hyperstatic union. Hyperstatic union. It means that when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he was 100% man and he was 100% God all at the same time. In other words, he never stopped being God. I think I've shared this with you before. In eternity past, there was a time when he was God and not man. But there was never a time when he was man and not God. The word incarnation also could mean enfleshment. That's what John said there. The word, the, the, the God of the universe put on a robe of flesh. He became a, a man in the flesh. Thus, the incarnation, next paragraph, did not affect the essential nature and qualities of deity. That in deity, D-E-I-T-Y, he was still God, but it did affect its manifestation. The glory of the Son, which uh, Son had with the Father in John 17, 5, was not evident while he was with men. However, at times, in his words and deeds, there were clear manifestations of deity. In other words, there's, a few, there's a, quite a few experiences in Jesus' life that prove that he was God. Let me give you, I'll give you a couple. Number one is when he was on the ship with his, with his disciples. He was in the bottom of the ship asleep. The wind was blowing. The sea was being tossed to and fro. Jesus was on board. He went out on deck of the ship and spoke to the wind and said, peace be still. Now only a God control the wind and the rain. In John chapter 11, Lazarus had been dead for how many days, y'all? Jesus went to the grave site. You know what Jesus, why Jesus said he, he tarried? He tarried, he said, because that the Father, that the Son may be glorified. Remember, Jesus never performed a miracle for the sake of a miracle. He never did. Every miracle you see in, G, in the Bible that Jesus performed was to increase the faith of those who saw it. That's the only reason Jesus performed miracles. To increase the faith of those who witnessed it. So whatever miracle, some, when God is working in your life, you know what God is trying to do? He's trying to increase your faith. He's not trying to act like you got, we got some special manifestation and other people don't have it. He's trying to increase our faith to let us know that we can trust him. Okay, go down to the next blank. In the narrative that Matthew, in the narrative that Matthew and Luke gives us of the birth of Christ, we learn that the incarnation was affected by the power of the Holy Spirit who wrought in the Virgin Mary in such a way that Christ's humanity was derived from her and yet was that holy thing in Son of God. In Luke 1 35, Christ was the seed of the woman and partook of our human nature but not of our sin. Y'all see it. Where did the sin come from? It came from the blood of the Father. So Christ took on our humanity, but because he didn't have Adam's blood, he did not partake of our sin. He was born without sin. Y'all see it? Okay. Number three, Christ's humanity shown by his earthly life. Christ's humanity shown by his earthly life. It's shown by his Christ's humanity, showing that he was a man, is shown by his earthly life. Everybody got it? Christ's humanity shown by his earthly life. Letter A, his human names. His human names. I'm not going to read the scriptures for you. He is called man and son of man. This, is, this lasts more than 80 times in the New Testament. Even after his ascension, these titles are still used in regard of him. The next blank is he is called the son of David. And I've already, you see 2 Samuel 7, 16? That, that is when Samuel had made, uh, God had given David a promise that someone would be on his line. He's called, the, let me go back to the son of man. The son of man means in his humanity, although he was God, he was still man. Y'all know he got tired. He was hungry. He had to sleep. He's called the son of man. Letter B, 
his human parentage and relationships. His human parentage and relationships. Let me just say he had an earthly father and an earthly mother, and he had brothers and sisters, right? Y'all know Jesus was the oldest, but he had other brothers and sisters. Y'all know they didn't believe any of them until after his resurrection. You all do know you can grow up in the same house with people and have different perspectives on life. If you have many brothers and sisters, some of you can be, you can believe one thing, some believe them, and you, you will be surprised how many people will believe different things who grew up with the, the same way. Let us see his growth in wisdom. His growth in wisdom in stature as other human beings. I'll just read Luke 252. This is what Jesus did. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. And, uh, and I, I'll read that. I just quote it for you, but I want you to read it, put it up for, for me. And I'm going to look at Luke 52. Look what it says. And Jesus increased. King James says, grew. He increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, this is important because Jesus and his parents were going to celebrate Passover. And he, how he was 12 years old, when he went with his parents. And while he was in Jerusalem at Passover, they left and headed back home to Nazareth and they left Jesus. And his, his mother and father frantically went searching for him. And when they found him, y'all know where he was? He was in the temple. He was asking questions and, and giving wisdom. And this is what he did. Uh, his mother and his father asked him, where are you? He said, do you not know that I need to be about? My father's business. I'm going to give you one other interesting note. From 12 years to he was 30, 18 years, you don't hear about Jesus. And Luke 252 tells us what he was doing. He was increasing in wisdom and in favor in stature with God and man. In other words, he was, he was, he was growing in wisdom. He was getting along with people. He was growing, and I want to say one other thing that he did. He was 12, but he went back home and subjected himself to his parents' authority. That was a good amen right there. Everybody understand? If Jesus subjected himself to his parents, what do you think we ought to do? Amen. Okay. Uh, let's go down to D. Go down to D. He had the form and appearance of, of a man. He looked like a man. As a matter of fact, Isaiah says that he, when you see him, there was no comeliness about him. In other words, when you saw Jesus Christ, there was nothing that would draw your attention to him. And Isaiah 53 says he was like a root out of dry ground. So when I hear people say, you know, they try to be, you know, try to make their appearance to make them holy, that may be what you do, but that ain't what Jesus did. When you saw Jesus, there was nothing special about him. There was nothing new. If you saw him, there was nothing in him that would draw your attention to him. He was just an average man. And sometimes we've allowed our culture to make us to be something, that we spend more time trying to become that more than what Christ wants us to be. And we chase it, we spend our energy on it, we let it spend our effort, we let people put pressure on us to make us do it, and being you is all right. Y'all know why being you is all right? Because that's the way God made you. God made me this height, he gave me this nose. Y'all know this nose ain't let me down yet. Y'all know I can smell fried chicken and collard greens two miles away. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He made me to color my skin. He picked my mom and daddy. You, didn't, you couldn't pick your father and mother. God picked them for you. God picked where you're going to be born. And if you learn to embrace it and say, this is that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that God made me this way, you'll be yourself. 
And I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I probably said it, and I think in another class. But George Ravlin was the was the coach of the uh, Southern, University of Southern California basketball team. I remember one day being over in Washington D.C. reading in the Washington Post, and at the headlines he says one of the hardest things to do. George Ravlin said this: one of the hardest things to do in life is not to be somebody else, but be who you are. I'm I, I'm, I'm the preacher that I am. I don't spend my time pastoring like everybody else. Y'all know why I don't do that? Not because I don't think other people have so much to offer that I can't glean from it. But what happens is you can emulate so many people so, many, so long that you can't even get around to doing what God told you to do. Amen. Amen. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? And, and it's very difficult for us because cu the culture put pressure on us to make us think that what success looked like. Success don't look like in the kingdom what it looked like in the world. You can be on top in the world and be nothing in the kingdom. So whoever you are, be yourself. Work with it. Do the best you can. And if you do that, I can guarantee you this. God will bless you like he'll bless anybody else. If you're from, if you're from uh, Aberdeen, don't be going leaving here. Talking about you from Baltimore. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? If you're from Churchville, don't be telling people you're from Philadelphia. You are from Aberdeen. <laughs> be yourself. Say it with me. Be yourself. <laughs> if people get upset at you, you be yourself. Y'all know why they get worked up just being yourself? Because they can't control you. They can't get you off your center. And people don't care for you like that. Amen. You don't have to be like anybody else but Jesus. In yourself. Okay, uh, there is no biblical, in the next paragraph, there's no biblical reason to use a halo around the head of Jesus. Y'all see that? As the artists so commonly do, we cannot say what he looked like as we possess no picture of him. If we did, we would probably worship it instead of him. Even after the, his resurrection, Jesus appeared in the form of a man. And, and, I, and I have here in my notes, when I was growing up, my, 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 my family had a picture of three people on plates on the wall. Who was the pe people, y'all? Who was number one? Martin, Martin. He wasn't Martin Luther King. Back then, he was Martin Luther the King. <laughs> Who else was the other picture? John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And who was the other person? And they had him on there with this long flowing hair. The Bible says that there was no image of him. So how do we show people the image of God? The image of God lives in you and me. We show them through love. We show them through obedience and faithfulness to him. Letter E. He subjected himself voluntarily to the physical limitations of human nature. Y'all got E? He volunteered, he subjected himself to the vol voluntarily to the physical limitations of human nature. Exception, sin, which is not an essential of human nature. He was hungry, thirsty, tired, uh, etc. Uh, he partook of all the experiences common to the race, except those which are sinful. He did not have to experience what is not common to the race as a whole. Changes, I.G., E.G., changes of state, matrimony, sickness, pneumonia, typhoid, physical impediments. Listen to what, he, what, 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 uh, what I'm saying in, in this text. He partook of everything except anything that was sinful. Put up Hebrews 4, I think it's 4.15. And I want to show you, show you this about, about who, who Jesus is and what he did. They remember, he, he wasn't someone you just want to look at, but he was still God. Listen to what it says. In Hebrews 4.15, jot it down in your margin. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, in other words, who can't relate to you in your weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we were, yet without sin. And what it means is in your human experience, 
you're going to have some difficulties in your life. You're going to be mocked, ridiculed, scrutinized, marginalized. And everything you can imagine you go through in your life, Jesus Christ already experienced it. With one exception. He never did anything that was out of the will of his father. That's what made him God. Whatever you're experiencing, Jesus said in John 16, 33, in me you may have peace. But in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. If Jesus have overcome, guess what you can do? As a matter of fact, if you're in Jesus, you're not going to overcome. You already overcame. You don't have to stay there. You're you overcomer the moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Look at letter F, then we'll stop there for tonight. Moral and spiritual limitations. Moral and spiritual limitations. Christ limited himself spiritually by his own will and therefore prayed as we do. He did not use the power of deity for himself, but only for others, and that only when necessary. He never showed off being God. We as Christians should not be showing off. Amen. Y'all know when we, we show off, you know you can start off in the spirit and move in the flesh. You can be careful. You got to be careful. Even when we are doing things for God, you can start off saying, God, I want to honor you. I want to respect you. And, and you can start feeling something in your flesh and you can move from the spirit in your flesh. And then there ain't, there, there's nothing else to it. Let me give you one example. I got some scripture here, but I want to give you one, one other example. Uh, you remember Samson? You remember Samson was strong? Because you don't know he had, to, had, he was a, had taken a Nazarite vow. And the first thing that God told him in Nazarite vows, he couldn't get a haircut. So he had long flowing hair. And one of the things that, that he did is he, people wanted his power, particularly Samson. And what was her name? Delilah. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says that uh, he laid his head in the wrong lap. And then J. Vernon McGee said he looked good without a haircut, with a haircut, but he didn't have no power. And I think I've shared this with y'all before. His power was not in his hair. His power was in his obedience. And so when we make anything external try to be our power, it may be earthly power, but it ain't no Holy Spirit power. And this is what he did. When he got a haircut, he got up one day and shook himself. And y'all know what happened? He didn't have no power. And there's a lot of principles in Samson. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more. Be careful how you hang around areas and people that God told you not to hang with. Be careful. Be careful with people that God have already given you a, rest a, 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 a restriction not to be hanging with. Because if you do, you're going to surrender. And you may start off strong, but you will surrender. That's what happened to Samson. Young people, your parents telling you, don't hang around with certain people. You may not see it, but they see it. I got a friend, and he's one of my classmates. And I won't call his name because he look at our services sometime. Power to the people. But my mother told me one time, she said, if you keep hanging with him, she said, you're going to end up dead or in jail. And that brother done been in every kind of situation you can imagine since the time we left high school. Father, we thank you for your word. It is true. I pray that you bless these, your people tonight. Keep us safe. But God, I pray that we will know these foundational truths of how our Messiah came.
that we are familiar with his humanity. Why is it important to us? Because, Lord, we are in our humanity and we struggle. But God, just like you overcame, you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. Father, bless us now. Bless those watching and listening. Bless those that are here that you receive the honor and the praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus. 
we get one more chorus of that. Just on fire, just knowing that Jesus is our Savior. Just listen to the word. on and put those hands together. Is the Lord worthy? Did you hear they say Jesus? The bright in the morning star. Our healer. Our keeper. Our redeemer. Our friend. Our king. He's the lover of your soul. He is important. He ought to be the most important person in your life. That's what we're studying tonight. The trouble it took for him to come all the way through time and eternity to come and save us. If no one else was here, he would have come for you by yourself. Isn't that great news? Let us pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise. We give you all of the honor because you are worthy you have proven yourself to be the savior of the world you died you was buried and on the third day morning you rose from the dead with all power in your hand you ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and God one day you're coming back We don't know when, but we want to be ready. And God, we thank you because one day we got ready. We put our trust in you. We put our hope in you as our only Savior. And Father, tonight we want to tell you thank you for being so good and for being so great. And Father, we realize that we haven't done almost anything that you really told us to do. But we thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness, your forgiving power, and for your grace, and for your mercy. And God, we thank you because you have given us another chance. You've given us another day to live for you, to honor you, Lord. And God, I pray tonight that you would give us strength that we may do what's pleasing in your sight. I pray tonight for the Parham family. I pray for our silver saints. I pray for those who are alone, who don't have family, who don't have friends, who doesn't have anyone that they can just talk to. I pray for our youth tonight I realize that they are facing a myriad of challenges on who God is. Is the Bible true? Who am I? Who God wants me to be? Why did he make me this way? And I'm asking you, Lord, to give them understanding from your word, through their parents, through this church and other churches that are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for marriages tonight. I pray for those that are single. I pray, oh God, that our lives would be reflective of what we say we believe. 
And God, I do realize that it come with some challenges. It come with some challenges of loneliness. It come with some challenges of being hurt. It come with some challenges of being betrayed, sometimes forsaken. But I'm asking you, Lord, for real strength tonight. For real strength in the power of your Holy Spirit. Give them what you would have for them to have. God, give me what I need that I might do your will, that my life may be pleasing to you. Not to the world, but to you. And God, we love you. We thank you, God. We pray also for those who have suffered bereavement. We pray, oh God, that you would be a company keeper for them. God, we pray that you would be a friend to them. And God, I do pray that they do not grow weary in well-doing. Help them to know, God, that you are on our side. You are with us. You are for us. And then, oh God, I lift up the president of this United States. I lift up everyone in authority. I lift up the Supreme Court. I pray the decisions that they make, the appellate courts, the circuit court. I lift up the judges tonight who's making decisions for this country. I lift them up before you. I pray for those that are online tonight. I pray that you would bless them, meet them at the point of their needs. And let them know that you're still good. You're still God. You're still gracious. You're still the God of joy. You're still the God of peace. And God, let them know that you still have a plan for their lives. Bless Mount Zion. God, as we endeavor to do your will, not our will, but we endeavor to do your will. So we're asking you tonight to give us wisdom. We're asking you, God, to give us courage to stand on your word. I pray for the families of this church. I pray, oh God, that you would bless every person, every member that is on this road. I pray that you bless them in ways like you've never blessed them before. I know, God, there are some guests who come. I'm asking you to bless them as well. Some show up Sunday after Sunday. Bless them, Lord. But I also pray that you let them make a decision that we may be obedient to your word. We love you, God. And then I do thank you for the opportunity to be a witness to those who are unsaved and unsure. I pray, oh God, that you let you would allow our light, light to so shine that men might see our good works and that we glorify our God, which is in heaven. Father, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say together, amen. Amen and amen. Come on and put your hands together and give, give God, give God, God some praise. Uh, we are going to have our food drive on this Saturday. I believe the volunteers are asked to show up at 930. Uh, please come out. Uh, also, there are some other announcements at the church that will be forthcoming. Uh, our Vacation Bible School is looking for volunteers. If you have children, you, have, you can teach, you can serve. Uh, the VBS is going to be on June 20th through the 24th. If you have administrative skills, come out and, and support uh, our youth, support our music ministry, support our arts and crafts. We're just going to have a good time. We're going to do outreach in the community, and we just thank God for you. And I do want to thank God for those who came out and participated in the car wash. Our evangelism had an awesome event where we washed a whole lot of cars, we witnessed the people, we served, or we prayed for people, and you know that's what the church is here to do. And I want to thank all of you for your participation and also for all of your prayers. Continue to keep each other in prayer, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, on this Sunday, uh, I know it's sad. Mother's Day is a sad day for me, uh, but I have sweet memories of my mother. She was a sweet lady. I love my mother, and uh, my mama loved me. Amen. A amen. So we look forward to seeing you at our uh, 745 Praise and Worship, worship at 8, also our Sunday school in between, and then it, we are going to have our second worship at 1045 a.m. Praise and Worship 
and the service will start promptly at uh, 11 o'clock. God bless you and have a great night. Come on in one more time. Put your hands together and give our God some praise. Have a great night. Hey, if you haven't made a decision for Jesus Christ, uh, go to our website, com complete a connect card. Let us know that if you have made a decision for Jesus Christ, we would love to have you. And also, if you have any prayer requests, go to the website. We will pray for you on every Tuesday night, and we want to serve you, and we want to be your church. God bless you. Once again, have a great night.